Ludwig Mies van der Rohe was an architect and designer from the early 1900s who was extremely influential in both fields, as well as in the development of modernism, the international style, and the progression of the Bauhaus movement. He developed some of the most iconic buildings of those styles in both the US and Germany, and dabbled in other areas of design, such as furniture design. One of his most iconic works, the Barcelona Chair, is still seen in countless large films and is still produced today uh, through a licensing deal with Miller Knoll. Mies is perhaps most well known for his idea that less is more and that God is in the details, which are both extremely apparent in his work. Born on March 27th, 1886 to Maria Ludwig and Michael Mies, Ludwig Mies was a German-American architect and designer. As the son of a master stonemason, Mies had architectural influences in his life from a very early age. While he never received any formal architectural training in his early days, he was fortunate enough to assist his father on a number of large job sites in his youth, giving him a strong understanding of what it means to build something. At age 15, Mies apprenticed at a small architectural firm. Here, he sketched ideas for architectural ornaments that would eventually be produced from stucco and come to decorate buildings. This would later become somewhat comical in the face of his radically minimal approach to architecture he would eventually develop. While divergent from his eventual path, the time at this firm helped him develop his skills for linear drawings, which would eventually lead him to create some of the most beautiful architectural renderings of this time. In 1905, Mies would move to Berlin at the age of 19 and become an apprentice to Bruno Paul, a well-known furniture designer of that era who mainly practiced in the Art Nouveau style. He used that experience and his experience at the architecture firm to eventually receive his first commission in 1907 to guide the development of a somewhat traditional suburban house. After an impressive architectural debut, Peter Behrens took notice of Mies. He would come to offer the 21-year-old a job at his growing firm. Here, he would become acquainted with others who would later develop the Bauhaus movement alongside him, Walter Gropius and Le Corbusier. After World War I, while still designing relatively traditional neoclassical homes, Mies began an additional, more experimental effort. He joined forces with his progressive thinking peers in the long-running search for a new style that would mesh better in the modern industrial age. During this era, a number of what many would consider to be poor design decisions were being made. With new access to industrial building techniques, a rethinking of architectural approach was necessary. Since the mid-19th century, less and less was handmade due to the Industrial Revolution. There was a time between where architects would try to replicate hand-worked, ornate buildings of the past, but with modern technology. However, there was something disingenuous and therefore not appealing to this approach. Mies and his colleagues sought truth in their practice and would come to develop what is known as the international style as a result. Here, they embraced modern industrial practices and created forms that synergized with these new techniques rather than fighting against them. They had a real focus on truth to materials and process. Beyond their own stylistic preferences, and design ethos, there was a growing desire to change architectural direction after World War I. The aristocratic classical revival styles were particularly disdained by many as the architectural symbol of a now discredited social system. Progressive thinkers called for a completely renewed design process guided by rational problem solving and a focus on truth to modern materials and structure over what they thought of as superficial construction of classical, more ornate buildings. While continuing his design practice, Mies quickly began to develop a number of visionary projects that, though mostly unbuilt, rocketed him to fame as an architect capable of giving form that was harmoniously tied to the ethos of the emerging modern industrial society. Mies threw ornamental design trends of the past to the wind and made a powerful modernist debut in 1921 with his stunning competition proposal for the full glass Friedrichstrasse skyscraper. He followed this up with a taller curved version in 1922, naming it the glass skyscraper. He constructed his first modernist house titled Villa Wolf in 1926 in Guben uh, for Eric and Elizabeth Wolf. This was shortly followed by House Lange and House Esters in 1928, 
Apologies for the pronunciation there. He continued on pushing modernism with a number of revolutionary projects, which all came together in his two European masterworks, the temporary German pavilion for the Barcelona Exposition, which was often called the Barcelona Pavilion in 1929, and the elegant Villa Tugendhat in Brno, Czechoslovakia, completed in 1930. A 1986 reconstruction of the German Pavilion is now built on the original site in Barcelona, if that's something you'd ever want to check out if you happen to be in the area. Beginning in 1930, Mies assumed the role of director of the architecture program at the Bauhaus Dessau. Unfortunately, due to immense political pressure, the Dessau location of the school was closed shortly after. In 1932, Mies rented a rundown factory in Berlin to use as the new Bauhaus with his own money in hopes of breathing a new life into the school. The students and faculty worked diligently to rehabilitate the building, painting the interior white along with a number of other aesthetic and functional renovations. Unfortunately, Mies struggled with significantly fewer resources and a much smaller budget to work with than his predecessors had been able to enjoy. Some of the most renowned designers of the previous faculty were also unfortunately lost in the move to Berlin. Although the Nazi party and Hitler did not have any cohesive architectural policy or style before they came to power in 1933, Nazi writers and influencers like Wilhelm Frick and Alfred Rosenberg had already declared the Bauhaus movement as un-German and criticized its modernist styles. They deliberately generated public controversy over issues like flat roofs and other elements that characterized the architectural movement. More and more, through the early 1930s, the Bauhaus was deemed as a front for communists and social liberals, which did not align with the conservative values of the Nazi party. This was a major reason for the Bauhaus's uh, eventual downfall. Even before the Nazis came to power, political pressure on the Bauhaus was rapidly increasing. The Nazi movement, nearly from its inception, denounced the Bauhaus for its degenerate art and other stylistic choices they deemed as un-German and therefore threatening to the nation. The Nazi regime was dead set on cracking down on what it saw as foreign, likely Jewish, influences of modernism. Although he did his best to remove any political affiliations and influence from the school's curriculum, this brief rebranding effort was largely unsuccessful. When the Nazis came to power nationally in 1933, the school was closed indefinitely under the intense political pressure and threats from the party. After the Bauhaus era and a number of years attempting to find work, Mises' modernist designs of glass and steel were not considered suitable for state buildings by the Nazis, and in 1937 he reluctantly followed his colleague Walter Gropius to the United States. After accepting a contract to design a residential building in Wyoming, Mies settled in Chicago, Illinois, where he was offered the position of head of the architecture school at Chicago's Armour Institute of Technology, which was later renamed the Illinois Institute of Technology. One of the many benefits of taking this position was that he would be frequently commissioned to design new buildings for the school, and eventually a master plan for the entirety of the campus. All of his design and work from this period can still be seen to this day, including the Alumni Hall, the Chapel, and in my opinion, one of his best works, the SR Crown Hall, built as the home of IIT's School of Architecture. His early projects at the IIT campus and for developer Herbert Greenwald presented to Americans a style that seemed a natural progression of the almost forgotten 19th century Chicago school style. His architecture, with origins in the German Bauhaus and Western European international style, became a celebrated style of building for American institutions, developers, and large corporations. Mises' career was full of innovation in the development of timeless structures and products, one of which was the Chicago Federal Plaza. This plaza unified three unique buildings, the mid-rise Everett McKinley Durkinson United States Courthouse, the high-rise John C. Klusinski building and the single-story post office building. The structural framing of the buildings is formed of high tensile bolted steel and concrete. The exterior curtain walls are defined by projecting steel beams painted with black graphite, which was a stylistic trademark of many of Mises' designs. The entire complex is organized on a 28-foot grid pattern broken into 4-foot, 8-inch sections. 
This pattern goes upwards from the granite plaza into the first floors of the two towers with the grid lines rising vertically up the buildings and integrating with each individual aspect of the plaza. Another iconic American work from Mies was the Farnsworth House. This structure has a unique story in and of itself, so I will just touch on this today, but if you want to hear the full thing, definitely let me know in the comments below. Between 1946 and 1951, Mies designed and constructed the Farnsworth House, which was meant to be a weekend escape outside Chicago for Dr. Edith Farnsworth. Here, Mies explored the synergy of the interior with nature and their impact on how we interact with each space. The largely glass structure is six feet above the floodplain of the Fox River and is surrounded by forest and rural prairies. The immaculately constructed clean white exterior and all glass walls construct a simple rectilinear interior space that allows nature and light to pass through the home. No walls touch the surrounding all glass enclosure. Full height curtains fixed on a track around the perimeter provide full or partial privacy when and where desired. The house has been described as sublime, a temple hovering between heaven and earth, a poem and a work of art. The Farnsworth House and its 60-acre wooded site was purchased in 2004 by the National Trust for Historic Preservation at an auction for $7.5 million. It is now a public museum if you'd ever like to visit. The design came to influence the development of many other modernist glass houses, such as the Glass House by Philip Johnson, which is also now owned by the National Trust. Next on our list, we have the 860 to 880 Lakeshore Drive Apartments, which were constructed over the years of 1948 to 1951 and came to represent post-war U.S. modernism. These towers, each glass, were radically different from typical residential brick apartment buildings that were common at the time. Mies designed four middle-class high-rise apartments for the developer Herbert Greenwald. The lobby is set back from the exterior structure, which was exposed around the perimeter of the building above. This design brought in loads of light and created a feeling of openness and freedom of movement at the ground level that became exemplary for endless new high-rises to come. Another well-known building by Mies is the Seagram Building. Although now celebrated and well-known as an architectural design feature, Mies had to convince Bronfman's bankers that a tall tower with significant open space at the first floor would create a sense of prestige as well as community for the building. Finally, one of Mies's last works was the Neue National Gallery Art Museum, the new National Gallery for the Berlin National Gallery. This is largely considered one of the best examples of his architectural approach. The upper pavilion is a pristine composition of massive steel columns and an overhanging roof with a glass enclosure. The simple yet elegant square glass pavilion is a powerful expression of his desire for flexible interior spaces, which are defined by transparent walls and supported by an external structural frame. While Mies is arguably most well known for his impact on German and American architecture, he was also incredibly successful as a product designer. Influenced by the ethos of the Bauhaus, which encouraged exploration of mediums outside your main discipline, Mies came to develop a number of furnishings for the interior of some of the homes he designed. One of these iconic designs he created was the Barcelona chair, originally made for the Barcelona pavilion discussed earlier on in this video. This chair was so well received that it actually is still in production today through the company Miller Knoll. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe had an incredibly impactful career and continues to influence designers and architects to this day. Although he unfortunately passed away in August of 1969 of esophageal cancer due to his love of cigars, he lives on through his work and impact. Many even outside of the field of design know him for his coining of the term, less is more, which has become a relatively common saying. After his cremation, his ashes were buried near other famous architects in Chicago's Graceland Cemetery. His grave is marked by an intentionally unadorned black slab of polished granite. It's funny how a lot of designers choose to be buried uh, in some something of this sort. For example, uh, Layla and Massimo Vignelli were both cremated and stored in black cubes and put in their walls of their church. Uh, so, kind of interesting there. So, it seems like it's kind of a, a necessary way for a designer to be buried and just put in some sort of black cube or something of this sort. But yeah, that, that's pretty much the end of today's video, guys. Um, if you found it interesting, it would be awesome if you'd leave a like. 
and hang around for future content like this. I'm um, going to be doing a lot more design documentary style things rather than the tutorials that typically happen on this channel. So if that's something that interests you, it'd be awesome if you would hang around for future videos. Um, and thank you again for watching today's video on Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Let me know what you thought in the comments below if you have any other questions or maybe something that I missed that would be uh, helpful for anybody else watching this video. Definitely leave it in the comments below. But uh, yeah, other than that, thanks again for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later.